So welcome everybody um, today to um, Radical Feminist Perspectives. We've got, um, today we've got Marin Ritigliano and Julia Long, and they are going to talk to us about Sonia Johnson's Going Out of Our Minds. Um, so uh, uh, over to you two. Oh, and you're both muted at the moment, so we need to unmute you. Good morning. Good Sonia morning. Johnson. Good morning, Marion. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Hi. So um, a, a bit about Sonia Johnson, um, at, 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 you know, just autobiographically at first. Um, she, um, she was from uh, Utah. She was a Mormon housewife. Um, her first book was published in 1981. <clears throat> called from housewife to heretic and the heretic part comes from the fact that she was excommunicated from the Mormon church in 1979 and she was excommunicated for two things it was one against speaking against patriarchy in um in the Mormon church um which is also called LDS or Latter-day Saints and um she also ardently supported the ERA the equal rights amendment um very very strong in fact there was a contingent of uh, Mormon women who had a uh, an ERA um, support effort <clears throat> and she wasn't she apparently wasn't the only one excommunicated but certainly the most prominent and they were pretty aggressive about it she ultimately also ran for president um, for uh, the 1984 election under the citizens party and got I think like 0.7 percent of the vote um, so <clears throat> the book itself um, you should know is autobiographical so she will be she starts out by <clears throat> pardon the coughing I'm in the in the U.S. and its allergy season, um, she um, s starts out by talking, you know, she's already in her first book, um, you know, uh, talked about how she went from housewife to heretic. And now she's talking about <clears throat> getting involved in the women's, what was then the women's liberation movement or, or women's activism. <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and, uh, and she, uh, you'll see as you as you read it, if you read it, and you should read it, that she'll she'll be really enthusiastic about. We did this. We found out that we worked on this, um, and then we found out it didn't work. And then she'll talk about <laughs> moving on to something else. Um, you know, for example, at first she talked about just regular activism with now and trying to to breach the uh, um, the defenses of of the um, the political institutions of the day. And talking about how that frontal assault didn't work and then she'll talk about <clears throat> um uh, uh civil disobedience as activism i mean she chained herself to the republican national you know party headquarters with a bunch of other women at one point to protest the era and she talks about other acts of civil disobedience and she's enthusiastic and then she gets to the end of it and says but that didn't work <clears throat> she talks about the fast this was a very this was in the news she fasted for like um it wasn't as much in the news as it should have been, but it was, you know, we heard about it, certainly. She fasted for a month. I mean, really, for a month, fasted, was so weak. Um, <clears throat> did it with a bunch of other women, um, talked about it, and then said, but it didn't work. <laughs> she talked about um, one technique called, you know, hearing into being, which was like a, <clears throat> a technique or a practice used in, you know, consciousness raising groups and, and how, you know, women could really um, be awakened um, and wanting to use it to, wanting to use that to come up with a vision for what, what, you know, what women wanted. And she goes all through it and it says, but we found out that didn't work. Um, <clears throat> so there's all these things that she's talking about, but as she's talking about it and what didn't work, she's talking about what she discovered along the way. Um, and having come from the Mormon Church, the Mormon Church, if you don't know, is a, a particularly conservative um, branch of, um, I, I guess, Christianity, but it also has its own, you know, scriptures besides that. And she recognized religion as a central pillar of patriarchy and, um, and you know, her, her church in particular as um, particularly uh, demonstrative of, you know, systemic <clears throat> male supremacy or male oppression of women. And she came and she finally, you know, realized that we're just asking the wrong questions. You know, we're asking how do we get national leaders to change their behavior? How do we get men to change their behavior? And what do we do about the state of the world? And she said that um, <clears throat> she, um, you know, every time she would have an epiphany or suddenly, you know, she'd get, suddenly I realized um, she had a college professor who ridiculed 
that whole concept of sudden realization. Um, she, but she, but she said that, um, and she argued with him unsuccessfully at the time because she was just you know, a student. He's the male professor. Um, that suddenly she realized means epiphany and raised consciousness. Um, so when you read her, just realize that she'll be very, very gung ho, and 20 pages later explain why she was wrong. <laughs> um, she, uh, Maybe yeah. as well, Mary. I, I'm, I was just thinking it's probably worth mentioning that for if. I know this is a very, very learned uh, kind of set of participants who, who come to these things, but um, if anyone isn't familiar with her work, a really good introduction is the other two videos on YouTube the, that kind of correspond with a lot of the ideas in this book. Go, go, I think they're called Going Further Out of Our Minds. Yes, parts one and two. Parts, yeah. And also, just if you do look at them, the first one, it, the quality is really bad at the beginning, but it's soon, so if you if you think, oh, it's not working, it, it soon kind of gets over it. But that introduces um, some of the really key ideas that she kind of explores <coughs> and sort of traces in, in more depth. Uh, in this book but also one of the things that I really like about her writing style is that um, obviously she's she's writing about her engagement in like protest politics and civil disobedience and the um, her relationship with the National Organization of Women she's writing about it in retrospect so I don't I don't really I don't recall that she, she she talks about what was good about the actions and they're not always what you would necessarily would expect in terms of the conventional ideas about protest and civil dis disobedience but i think it's it, it's not quite that at the end at the end of each bit she says oh well, that didn't work she says like oh what i thought at the time so it's i find it quite intriguing that yeah. you're always kind of you're you're going through these moments she kind of takes you along these different steps along the path like the the fast uh, which i would really enjoy discussing with you mary like what you think about that um the you know the running for president the her kind of um clashes with the the kind of senior women of now you know all the, these kinds of things um but she's always talking about it in reflectively and in retrospect and saying oh, what I thought at the time and I don't think now which I found a really um, engaging way of writing about it because you feel that she's going to tell you something important and obviously that's that you get the conclusions that she comes to in in the final chapters don't you where um, what you know what she says there and I, I would be really interested to talk about it with you and see what other women think that basically she comes to the conclusion that pretty much the, the kind of bread and butter of, of feminism the women's liberation movement of the time that had become very much about lobbying and petitioning and then even in more extreme forms the civil disobedience was all about trying to change men and her conclusion and I remember when I was you know doing one of these with some other women a few weeks ago we were talking about her essay taking our eyes off the guys and that's very much the conclusion that she comes to isn't it that that's what we need, yeah. to, do. We need to take our eyes off the guys um but <coughs> when you think about all of the implications of that i can see why it must have been um received as uh, you know there were a lot of women and i still see now there are a lot of women who are really angry about it um angry about um her rejection of you know I, I recall she says you know she wouldn't even she wouldn't go on a march anymore she wouldn't i think she wouldn't vote she wouldn't participate at all and given so much of i guess political movements generally and certainly i think what feminism has become now is so much about focus on you know trying to get laws either changed or stopped or trying to get you know influence policy makers it's become so much about that that if if someone says actually she's come to the conclusion that that is not only a waste of time but it's actually damaging that it's actually damaging and collaborative then you can see why it's generated um you know a, a, well a lot of a lot of um I've certainly seen uh, comments on Facebook that have been really angry at that, but I, I find I find her ideas 
really quite compelling, I must say. But maybe we should trace it through a little bit. Yeah, more. yeah. She, um, you know, when you, you're talking about the fast, that was one of the, you know, earlier actions that she did. And um, she had a conversation um, with, with Dick Gregory, who was well known for, he was a, a sort of a comedian and whatever back in the day and did some fasts to protest things. And, um, and she said she started thinking about um, where real power comes from and, and that it was more spiritual. And she talked a lot about um, developing this spirituality um, and that Dick Gregory said that, and she was, you know, she was lamenting that nobody was really paying attention to the fast, and 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 she came to the conclusion that it was really about purity of purpose and intent, and about love. Um, and when she ran for president, I mean, I'm going to read a, a few passages here and there from the book. She said, you know, I ran for president to reach millions of people with the urgent message of radical feminism, the most transformative and dangerous, because the most taboo-defying philosophy in existence. The message that the oppression of women is the archetypal oppression, the one upon which all others are modeled. Feminism posits that men raped and exploited and enslaved women before they went across the river and invaded the neighboring tribe. That men learned the power over paradigm in their kitchens and bedrooms, their caves and huts, through their most intimate, most formative relationships with, with mothers, lovers, and wives, and that they subsequently applied it in all areas of their lives, operating within the dominant, submissive, dichotomous mindset in all subsequent affairs. Thus did the sadomasochistic paradigm, which is patriarchy, slouch into the world. So she knew this stuff early on, and um, she was discovering this early on. Mm. She felt that, you know, genuine spirituality for women, and she writes this, that genuine spirituality for women will always have its foundation in, radic in radical feminist analysis, which is like, I mean, you know, where does that come from? Mm. You know, it's... And it, and it and it comes from this um purpose and intent and love of, for women. Yeah. Did what did you think about um because so, again quite a bit of her writing did there was a kind of religiosity about it. I mean, I I don't I can't say that I really relate to this word of spirituality because it seems to me and I I don't think her writing um her writing conveys this. Uh, but it's it's so much based in that kind of patriarchal dualism of you know the the mind and the body or the you know the spirit and the body and the, so I I can't say I've found <coughs> I particularly related to to her use of of that word. Um, but but did you she she addressed that though? Did you you remember the part where she says that um, that she re totally rejects the notion of putting a skirt on God? She says. And calling him the oh, goddess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that God, yeah. goddess ritual is okay if it's only metaphorical, but yeah. that no goddess rituals or events should mm. stress our helplessness yeah. or need to be rescued or dependent on strong spiritual leaders um, or encourage emotionalism. Um, and that's when she went on to say that genuine spirituality always has its foundation in radical feminist analysis. But that radical feminist analysis led her to this conclusion that we don't ordinarily think of a spiritual that only when we stop obeying men do we truly begin to live. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I personally would not use the word spiritual in, in that set. I, I, I know, use that, but I know. Because I, 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 I think it brings in a whole kind of a set of concepts, a whole set, set of baggage. But, but one of the things that I thought as I was reading it um, was, you know, that, that, that discussion with Dick Gregory and, and his comments and her idea about the purity of intent and and the fast as well and um, I can't remember now some of the other aspects of the book did I some of the language that she uses did seem to me I wondered if you know given that she'd come from such a religious background and then had been excommunicated and then obviously kind of rejected it all herself um, but some of the books still seem to have some. Of, did you think some of those kind of trappings of, of religiosity? And I, oh yeah, um, and, you know. I oh wonder, yeah. Um, in particular, about I must say that the chapter about um, about the fast. I mean, obviously, I I wasn't around at that point, and um, you know, I I can see. You know, she talks a lot about what it was about, and she is very careful to 
set out the differences between what she sees as um, the sort of patriarchal nature of a hunger strike and the difference between the far, you know the fasting and the intent behind the fasting and that and she says that um, that you know fasting is is a it's a taboo for women like to do something so extreme it was seen as kind of a, a male area but I really I I really parted company with her there because I I think I I. I really recoil against anything that makes women physically weaker because women, you know, it, there's something that was just so passive about it. I felt that, um, you know, to, to deny yourself food and to, to, um, to kind of make your point or to have your intention manifest in that way, to me, seemed so antithetical to um, like, it, it, it seemed consistent with, you know, the medieval saints or anorexics. Or, yeah. so I thought actually that because it, it's, su it's such a kind of a passive and kind of self abnegating form of, uh, I guess it was a form of resistance, wasn't it, at the time? So yeah. I, I found she that. She came to agree with you, though. What? Sorry? But she, she came to agree with you. She mm. came to agree with that, that it was passive. I mean, she even said that, you know, doing things like that, like, you know, the, the civil disobedience, the fasting, and um, even running for president, is that, you know, when we oppose something, you know, we, we just stand up and oppose it, we become its unwitting accomplices, mm -hmm. because we bestow the energy of our beliefs um, upon it when we reinforce it as reality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's, she's fasting and doing this, you know, destroying her body in the meantime. Um, so that makes it seem like what she's fasting for um, is an important reality in our lives. And that's, that's where she started to get this germ of an idea about, uh, about collaboration. And she mm -hmm. even came to see the fasting as collaboration because, mm -hmm. you know, she's opposing a system that she was now endowing with so much power mm -hmm. over her life. Mm -hmm. um, well, you well, know, she so we talk about that because I do think that's, I mean, that's such a central idea, isn't it? That she comes to that conclusion that, um, that, Oh, that she's got some great sort of slogans. I know she doesn't really like sloganeering, and neither do I. But you know, when she says like what we what we resist persists, it, it encaptures so much of all of her kind of experience and thinking um, that leads her to exactly what you're saying. That the more um, the more uh, kind of uh determinedly and defiantly we try to resist something we're actually putting energy into that thing and we're whatever it yeah. is we're saying about it if we're you know we're saying this is terrible we're still saying it's important because what we say about it is less important than the fact that we are putting energy into that so what she argues is what we resist persists and i remember in the in the video she talks about how women's resistance to patriarchy is actually useful to to men and to the system of patriarchy, oh, yeah. because it yeah. highlights where there might be gaps that they need to reinforce, and it it helps them to kind of shape shift to um, to kind of come back, if, you know, from a different direction, or yep. you know, to reinforce yep. that kind of thought that she talks about. And obviously, I think we've seen that so evidently over you know the past years since the women's liberation movement. Um, but obviously, if we look at what at what we're what we're doing for the most part, I guess, other than separatists who, you know, um, by its very nature is separatism is kind of less visible. But what we see in the visible women's movement is exactly that. It's all about resistance. And that word doesn't really go in any way um, challenged it's you know it's seen as a as a really kind of kind of the the almost i don't know the defining the defining uh sort of drive and motivation of of the women's movement so so i just yeah wondered, i just wonder what you what you think about that and maybe if we could talk about how it how it relates to what's going on today where so much of the movement is about um lobbying and petitioning and trying to influence and you know that kind of thing in this country less of the civil disobedience certainly because the main groups um, at the moment are very concerned with what she talks about at the beginning being being respectable and trying to win over the men in power 
but so there's less of the civil dis disobedience but that that idea of rejecting resistance i think uh, you know it it's it's interesting because it's so odds with what i see happening and what um so she, it's, it's a really challenging idea she saw this early on i mean <coughs> excuse me um even as she was like trying out all well, it's trying out simple disobedience and finding out what it did in terms of just like trying to push back she was having and the book and it's really you know you can see it in the book she started to having have this emerging consciousness that led her to the final you know we'll talk later about what what going out of our minds means i mean she 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 talks early on that she found out that she you know she felt that it would even it's immoral of her to let a man figure centrally in her life in any sexual and intimate way and i know that in such a situation, I could not help but be in constant reaction to his expectations and values, even if he were a sensitive man um, and struggling against the male value system himself. I sensed that such reaction would prevent my discovering, articulating, and acting upon my own female expectations and values. With the advent of feminism to act out of my own center had become my basic morality. So even as she's like discovering that you know, all this political action is just giving them more power and more power and more power. She's starting to have this emerging consciousness that, um, that, you know, this interaction, whether it's on a personal level or on a whole political um, social level, um, is just giving them more power. And she, you know, she um, initially was a, you know, she called herself hopelessly heterosexual. <laughs> for the longest time. Um, and, you know, Mary, she was talking to Mary Daly once who, um, she told Mary Daly, I'm, heter I'm not a lesbian, and Mary Daly just said, well, not yet. Um, and, and Sonia... Well, he says about her, about her book, this is, this is the most lesbian book apart from mine. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, Sonia did fall in love with one woman, only one woman. Um, and after she did, she realized she was no longer attracted to men, like, at all. Um, so talks, and she talks, there's a whole chapter, isn't there, about her kind of process of, of becoming lesbian, which... Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, she, she said that she's not, you know, she realizes that all feminists are not going to become lesbians, um, but it's a fantasy, most refreshing to the soul. But it's a way of being in the world that is most destructive of male supremacy. And as that way of being, um, lesbianism is the highest treason. For women to, to, and this is where she really starts to get it, for women to take our energy and attention, our sexuality, our primary loyalty, our deepest affinity out of the service of men and to bestow it all, all this richness, all our treasure upon women is the most powerful subversion of patriarchy possible on earth. So she started with something that was very personal to her and began to, you know, generalize it to, um, without even knowing that that's what she was doing, um, began to generalize it to, um, what, you know, what we could, um, what w would we want? And she, and when she started meeting with more women, there's a lot of what I call, you know, kind of woo about, you know, visioning and affirmation and mm -hmm. some of which um, may be very good personally. And that was, there was also some things that she said ultimately were not, you know, bedrocks um, or even necessarily particularly useful in, act in, um, in uh, activism. But she said, think about, you know, what you want, the kind of, you know, what do we want to be? Don't think about what we want to change. Think about what do we want to be? Um, and she, you know, there was one thing where they, you know, made a list of if the world is going to be, if they were going to walk out into the world, if we're going to walk out into the world, um, make a list what you do want it to be and what you don't want it to be. Um, and what, what, you know, for every woman, what, what they did want it to be was, um, all the things that you see when women are in complete community, you know, with themselves away from um, what men um, expect or, or do um, to us. Um, and all the things that they didn't want were basically male socialization. Mm. Um, the, um, so. And so, again, that's another one of her kind of <laughs> catchphrases or slogans is that, that is that the means are the ends. And, she, um, and I think, again, I've, I find that a really... Uh, really quite a compelling idea that um, that rather than um, projecting you know this idea of the future and then sort of setting out a map of like going from A to B to C that actually if we want to create if this is the world we want to create we have to start doing that now and what does that mean for each of us individually in terms of our own kind of personal 
um, responsibility and our responsibility to ourselves. Um, I, I, do, I did find some of you mentioned there about the affirmations and some of it, I don't know if it's a bit of a cultural thing. It, it seemed, it, to me, it did seem uh, kind of very American and it, they were kind of elements of a sort of self-help kind of ethos I thought around around uh, some of it like with the affirmations and things like that which um yeah it, it didn't really do much for me but at the same time um I really appreciated what she says about the nature of reality and the and the um, relationship between our perceptions and our thinking and then and how that manifests in reality and so what those I think what those affirmations seem to be about were about shifting perception and thinking and feeling and then how that would manifest itself in the world so I, I could see you know I could see where um, she was coming from with that but again I think probably to a lot of British feminists uh, <laughs> wouldn't know. Well, well, a lot of that had to do with um with, with trusting women I mean, a lot of this, um, you know, affirmation that she, you know, she was like, this was the original believe women. I mean, she, she, she talked repeatedly about trust women, trust women, trust women. Um, and, and cause that was part of, of loving women. I mean, you know, she, and she was, she was very aware of like, um, basic, um, you know, basic radical feminist analysis, you know, why there's, horizontal, you know, women to women hostility, you know, it, it's safe because we're not allowed to behave that way toward men, you know, and it, it provides this kind of sadistic or, you know, patriarchal pleasure that there's almost an addictive kind of fix from it, um, you know, mean girls, uh, which, which hadn't come out yet. Um, so, I mean, so she, she, she knew um, basic radical feminism, um, but she um, um, she said after she got divorced, um, she realized that women don't need need men, but men need women in the same way that slaves never need the master to survive and flourish, and that it's the master who needs the slaves. So, so if you know, women talk about I'm not a victim, I'm not a victim, um, I have agency, I have agency, um, but you're in a prison camp. You know, you're in a prisoner of war camp and you have as much agency as any other prisoner, depending upon the choices you make. And she she saw that. I mean, she, you know, she she'd read Mary Daly and she she saw that in um, um, in in her, you know, relation in her in the church she grew up in, in her marriage, which by all, you know, by all accounts was considered a good marriage. She said he was, you know, a, a decent guy. They had what she thought was great sex. Um, you know, the, it, it, was, it seemed on the surface to be a really good marriage, but she was able to extrapolate from all this personal stuff um, to what it meant for women politically. Um, and she talked and she talked like Mary Daly did about sadomasochism um, and uh, um, and rape being basically um, the relationships between men and women. And that, again, if you, you know, if you like try to resist that on a political le level you only empower them more mm. Mm. but i think i mean i suppose some of uh, the i the ideas about um uh, women in you know when she talks about women being in you know being in a jail but the doors wide open and we could just walk out i mean that that clearly that may be true in some circumstances, I think, particularly in relation to things like heterosexuality, but clearly in other circumstances, that is just not true. I mean, the, there is there are certain circumstances where women, you know, clearly can't just walk out and it's not just... No, they can't. No, 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 they can't. And she's not talking about that. She's just talking that's about... I think she, that's, that's where I really kind of take issue with it because I think she needs needs to be a lot more um well unless I've missed something but I think she needs to be a lot more kind of careful and uh explicit about that because you know yeah. I mean look at look at what's going on now in Afghanistan look at you know yeah, yeah. 
the trafficking and prostitution. Look at, you know, there are, there is so many, you know, uh, young girls being subjected to forced marriage and female yeah. genital mutilation. You know, there are a lot of circumstances where that really isn't the case. And I think for her to use words like slavery as she does, I think sometimes it, it really needs to be, um, uh, it needs to be more careful and, you know, then it needs, it just needs to be a bit more carefully uh, analysed and uh, set out, I think, because, I mean, I totally agree that, you know, the way that the ideology of romantic love works, for example, like heterosexual romantic love, and even, you know, a lot of the times that kind of same ideology is, I, I think, is also brought into lesbian communities as well. It's, I don't think there's, you know, at the moment, I don't really see a hugely serious challenge to that. And so I think, you know, it, the ways that, um, you know, uh, for certain scenarios, I think that metaphor of the jail with the door open is, is very, very valid. But there are also those those that aren't. And I think that's that's a kind of it's important to just be you know distinguish I know she says somewhere I can't remember if it's in this book or elsewhere she says like you know oh for those of us who can we need to be yeah doing what what the conclusion that she comes to at the end of kind of you know which is a I guess but I I think what you're talking about um you know saying that there, I mean, the enslavement of women in Afghanistan is clearly nothing like what's going on here. Absolutely nothing. And and I and I think that that's that that's um easy to see. But I think um, most women don't see it um, in reverse. That the enslavement of women in Afghanistan starts with what's happening here. Um, you know what's ha what happened in Texas is absolutely not what the Taliban is doing in Afghanistan. Not at all. Not even remotely. Um, but the Taliban started with a bunch of um, sadomasochistic men who think it that it is men's, you know, it is men's purpose in life to dominate women, um, and they they happen to be in a system and a culture where they could get away with it and push more and more and more until we see what we see now. So I think that you know most people understand, and she was more more clear about what you were saying in in subsequent books. Mm -hmm. So I think most 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 women understand that that how much worse it is, you know, for other women, but, um, but don't understand that, um, you know, when it comes to things like, uh, you know, hurting others, asking to be hurt, uh, dominating others, asking to be dominated, humiliating others, asking to be humiliated, um, is, is um, feeding the basic patriarchal addiction, that that is kind of the, the, the seed of sadomasochism that blossoms into what we see in Texas, that if it, if the, goes on and on and on and on and on becomes the Taliban in Afghanistan. But, even, um, but I think even as we're talking about, I, I don't even necessarily see it, it. I think aside from what's happening at the kind of legislative level and the oppression of women through, you know, political and, you know, legal institutions. Um, one of the things that I, where I do think that the metaphor of the jail with the open door is is so appropriate is heterosexuality because um you know in spite of all of the evidence um which is absolutely beyond overwhelming you know and most women say in your country or my country would probably think of ourselves as you know well maybe we wouldn't but um my experience of uh, kind of women that I talk to outside of any kind of like feminist movement uh, basically have a perception that we live in a free country and what they what they do or what we do is through our free choice and so we can see women um, endlessly forming you know forming relationships with men marrying men you know if when you know when when women and men get married, it's usually the woman who's done all of the organizing of that, who's done all of the, you know, taking care of, you know, all the invitations, all of the, um, the ceremony or the celebration, you know, all of the huge amount of work. It's, it's women who are doing that. It's not the, it's not the men, the men just sit back and, you know, then enjoy the day when it happens and then enjoy a, you know, lifetime of, of being serviced. So that I think is where that jail metaphor is so, is so apt. 
because um, even you know without talking about legislation, you know, if we're talking about um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis at the moment about free speech and you know freedoms and you know all the rest of it. Um, the whole COVID thing about the freedom not to wear a mask, you know, all of this. But look at how many women so not just willingly but eagerly give up freedom in terms of harnessing or you know hitching themselves to a man like for you know often for the rest of their life so that's where I think um that's where I think that metaphor is is so apt and um yeah I, uh, I, th I think the sorry Mary, just um and I think that often we don't really well, some of us look at that and have something to say about it. But if we look at the sort of mainstream movement that is so preoccupied with lobbying and petitioning and going to see MPs and having protests and speaking out and all of this kind of thing, there's very, there seems very, very little, if any, attention paid to, you know, the person who is political. And it, it seems to me it's as though we're all going to protest outside the church on a Sunday morning, but the rest of the week, everyone's putting the flowers on the altar and sewing the vestments of the priests, you know, if we're going to use these sort of religious analogies. So, so I, I do find her work really like invaluable in terms of, I suppose, all the looking at all the implications of the personal being political. And, you know, um, to be, you know, hopeful, um, she, she did address like, what do we do about this? It was just a comment in the chat. Um, about uh, lesbians being some of the most vocal trans women or women people, um, lesbians with the T. And um, there's a saying, um, TRA in the streets, turf in the sheets. Um, lesbians, if they, especially young ones, their only social setting are these um, alphabet soup groups um, where these uh, autogynephilic heterosexual men are unbelievably heavy handed and coercive um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, towards um, young lesbians who are, you know, discovering their sexuality or know that they're, they're lesbian and, and they would, these lesbians would be ostracized, um, coercively raped. I mean, really awful stuff happens to them. So um, I, I, I feel, you know, we can see it as a betrayal, but this, this is like a status quo and it's maintained by keeping um, women separated from each other. I mean, if there was a, another space for young lesbians, um, they would, you know, there would be a kind of a solidarity. So, but we're kept apart. It, um, it's disjointed. And if things are disjointed, um, it can absorb a lot of trauma, you know, without, without much disruption. You know, you, you've got, uh, you can, you can destroy one, one link if there are 80 zillion other links in a jumble all around it and no one will notice. <clears throat> so, you know, the, it, everything depends on, it, it all depends um, to maintain the status quo and women not working together. Um, and, and she said, you know, we need to preserve, per, you know, perceive our commonalities and to persist um, and that we won't see effects for a while. The system doesn't change a piece at a time. She felt that there was, when there would be a critical, what she called a critical mass of agitation of the value system, um, you know, that can no longer be absorbed or accommodated, then there'd be a flip-flop and that it only takes a few of us to do this. Um, and she was very, very, um, she exhorted women to just persist, persist, persist. Um, and Marion, you know. Mary, I'd like to, I'd like to go back to something, just what you were saying there uh, reminds me of really early on, I think it's in like one of the first or second chapter, the second chapter maybe, oh yes, I think it's called something like um, Women Against Women. Um, and she talks about the whole phenomenon of trashing women and she looks at the um the sort of dynamics of how what she would say the like the sort of like sadomasochistic uh power play of patriarchy gets imported and played out within feminist circles where it's a kind of organized feminism she talks particularly about the organization the national organization of women and she says that um that uh let me just find it on page 53 she says um uh she talks oh, about it as an addiction that women uh, actually talks, start to be said, addicted to. and again i think this is a, an interesting thing to to discuss she says that after what had happened to her at one of these uh, national organization um 
of women meetings where she was kind of seen as um, some kind of insurrectionary or that she was um, uh, trying to sabotage their event, something like that. And she says, I concluded that woman hating among women is the most serious problem in the world because she says, if it is true, as I believe it is, that women's destiny is to save the planet by rising out of our own oppression, this compulsion to compete with and destroy other women is our deadliest enemy, um, absolutely ensuring failure. If we fail, if the women's movement fails, all is lost, and not only for women, but for everyone. And she gives um, she gives an example of the type of thing which I think we've probably we can all recognise the example of the the book club, doesn't she? The, the of the book club where the person who the woman who set up the book club is then seen to have kind of got ideas above her station, and everyone kind of like sets up either to defend her or to take her down. And I think we've all either sort of being involved in or witness this kind of thing. So I just wondered what, what your thinking was of that, because it really ties in with the conclusion that she comes to at the end of the book, that, that loving women is the most um, fundamental revolutionary act. Yeah, she talks, um, she also talks about it as being, um, remember, like an addiction. Um, she says that it, it's like, you know, women will, uh, a woman will trash another woman or take her down a peg to, or take her down to size or whatever um, and get a kind of pleasure out of it um, from, uh, from other women and certainly from, you know, men who know, who know that she's doing this. Um, and she, she says if, um, um, if a woman is really, really strong and just stands up and like doesn't care that they're being trashed, that she gets left alone. Um, so that, so that women, um, go and you know find find a woman who is um who is devastated by being trashed um and they'll trash her some more and trash her some more and she you know she talks about a scenario well then there'll be tears and then and then the women who trashed her will say it's okay you didn't know you know you you're like and and try and pull her back into the fold um and that and that they realize well they don't realize but they get pleasure out of it they get an addictive kind of like rush out of it and it's true i mean they do there's you know, there's studies about the kind of plan, and, and there's these are studies on on men about <laughs> the kind of um, pleasure and uh, pleasure centers in the brain, things that are stimulated when they're, you know, being sadistic. Um, that's probably also probably also occurs in women um, to some extent. I mean, we have you know far less testosterone, but um, but but she talks about it as an addictive pleasure um, that it's sadomasochistic, and it is. That it is, yeah. That she she talks about. Um... The patriarchal nature of it, doesn't she? And the that, pa that sadomasculinity is a patriarchal paradigm, and then women, obviously within that within patriarchy, um, don't ex we don't experience ourselves as having power or even kind of being right or whatever. So within these spaces that we create, then you can it, it's easy to see how these hierarchies can form, and then women can get that rush of suddenly feeling like, oh, I'm right about this and she's wrong, and but. But obviously we, it's something that we see and let's be honest, have probably participated in because it's not always these other women over there, you know, we're yeah. all part of it, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I kind of wondered what you think about it as well. Like, um, do you think that it's inherent as soon as, I mean, I see at the moment there's definitely some kind of hierarchy getting established in this country in terms of um, who's, you know, I, uh, uh, in terms of the kind of structures that we have, the groups that we have, who is seen as a legitimate voice or a kind of voice worth listening to and who isn't. And I kind of wonder if that, if, if, it's, if it's actually avoidable, if we, if we have these kind of structures like, you know, setting up groups. Um, I don't know, what, what, what do you think? Do you... I think that violence against women, whether it comes from men or from women, um, originates in men's in men's domination of women, um, and, and she wrote something similar to that in her book as well. Um, it's all violence against women is male violence, even when women are carrying it out. And this is going to, you know, the, the you know, this is something that women absolutely rail against. It's, you know, it's like I'm not participating in patriarchy. I have my agency. I have this. I have that. No, I mean, if you're if you're doing this to women, violence against women, statism against women, um, you know 
doing this sort of thing to women is 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 male socialization through and through it it's not you know men you know i i think that i think men are like lesser human beings but it's not genetic you know they're not born that way they're not they're male socialization creates lesser human beings in a society that functions um with on purely male socialization will always be a, a horrible place to live in, in comparison to a society that functioned purely on female socialization, which has its problems also. So I don't think it's innate. I mean, there's no evidence for that anyway. Um, but, but I think that when women do it, it's because of it's, it's collaborative. Um, and women do not want to hear that they're, they're collaborating um, with the status quo of, of patriarchy um, that, that men have established. I mean, you know, it, it is, you know, women are not raped. Men rape women. It's never accidental. Um, women are not um, slammed down um, professionally. Um, you know, men slam women down professionally. It's never accidental. Um, it is what men want. It is, it is how society functions. It's the status quo. Um, if, if, women, if women were able to... Um, to break out of, I mean, you know, if, if women just absolutely said no and didn't participate in it, the entire patriarchy would fall apart. And that's what she, when she gets to the end of the book, um, that's, that's what she starts to talk about. And this is the part that's so controversial um, about not collaborating and simply disengaging. Um, and she, she also talks about male and female cultures as different value systems, what we would probably call, you know, socialization, male and female socialization, but they are completely different value systems, absolutely different value systems. Um, and what she says is that the most loving and compassionate act that women can perform for men is to stop feeling responsible for them, for their feelings, for their happiness, to disengage and let men do it themselves. Um, and that, you know, all human beings must begin to just, you know, like act like women at our best um, in terms of female socialization. The experiences, I mean, the, the stuff that most men interpret as, you know, bad in their everyday lives um, are, are, you know, they're, they're random. You know, they're not systemic. They're not woven into the fabric of society. But the things that happen to women are systemic and they are absolutely woven into the fabric of society. Um, she says, you know, she doesn't know that women would do it, but that we should simply agree um, to not have, you know, any more children until patriarchy is gone for the earth. Um, and that, you know, what we can really change um, um, is, is only ourselves. Um, and and she, she just keeps hammering away that we collaborate with our oppressors, something that women, uh, you know, become furious when you mention, when you mention that. Um, she, uh, I, wonder, I see we've got about 10 minutes left. I wonder if we should um, invite Joe to bring some. Uh, well, I wanted to read a couple more passages um, to kind of leave something hopeful at the end where she's talking about what, what we should do and what going out of our minds um, actually means. And I'll skip to that passage near the end. Um, when she, you know, her, her whole, the whole point of the book is, is, you know, in the title is that going out of our minds means making uh, a genuine, permanent disengagement announcement. And from that moment, not taking men or patriarchy seriously ever again, not denying them, just simply forgetting them. Patriarchy and men are both profoundly irrelevant. Going out of our minds means knowing that women are now the only relevant people on earth as far as change is concerned. Um, women and the way we view the world, the way we live in it at our best. It means taking ourselves seriously, um, the only act now possible in it that has the power to transform the world. So her solution ultimately to all this is something that, you know, a lot of women just kind of go, what? I mean, it's, it's basically, and, and it, I also heard it termed abandoning men, but it's disengaging from them, abandoning them emotionally. I mean, just leaving them be and going and, and being, being women, um, you know, women's culture. I, so I've I've joined now, um, and I I would say that links up to um, what I got from Mary Daly's sort of ideas of metapatriarchal consciousness of when you when you first hear the concept, or, and you know we've done it maybe as kids, and we we did ignore 
males a lot of the time, like I certainly did. But when you hear it written and you you think, oh, wow, we can actually do that. We can just forget about them and just disengage and not put our energy. I think that's really powerful to to, to actually hear those. So whether we it can all we can always do it because we have to sometimes fight against oppression and a lot of the time there's in my mind, there are things we have to do in order to defend ourselves. But it is really useful as a concept to think a lot of the time you can just choose to do it just there's a load of people in the room go and just never talk to the men just never even bother and engage with them and we can choose that a lot of the time so it's it and i think it, it, it is one of those taboos they don't want women to know that and they don't want girls to know that so for me when i heard it i thought that that's really really useful idea um and i still quite often use it like i think oh yes i can actually choose what i do with my time some of the time so yeah really good one, okay. one more passage yeah. just because i really i mean you know it i don't know if anybody's gonna read the book and she just expresses you know there's like little sections in there where she expresses things she said that you know for thousands of years patriarchy has sent us the message in every imaginable way that we can save ourselves by concentrating on the men and their reality um it's a superstition and a lie and it's a complete reversal um, as men well know, the truth is that our concentrating upon them gives them the power to destroy us. Our attention, our energy, our fear feed their madness. Um, it's true that we inadvertently but powerfully help bring about that which we most fear, which is why fear must be such a huge part of tyranny. Um, and the death of patriarchy depends upon our, our ability to stop doing all we do in reference to men. We can fight um, or, you know, or do what we do, but not in reference to men. We need to stop letting our fear of how they'll feel and what they'll think, what they'll do, determine our behavior. Patriarchy's death depends on our ability to turn our emotional backs on it and to decide how we want to feel and to begin feeling that way immediately. Um, I swear that what we need to do most is that which scares us most and which seems to be just the opposite of what we should do. We must take our eyes off the guys um, and do it and be very, very cold and unemotional about it. You know, these are just irrelevant creatures. Um, you know, we, we can do what we need to do, um, you know, to make our lives better, but we should do it with no reference to, um, to you know, men's feelings or to, um, you know, consorting with them. I think, um, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to do justice to the final chapter of the book in, you know, a, a, yeah. short, a short discussion like this. I mean, for me, I suppose having, you know, having worked for a few years in the women's sector and, you know, supporting women who've been uh, living with uh, male violence uh, and coercive control, uh, you know, of them. Um, to me, a, a microcosm of this would be if, like, one of the things that I see happening in the women's sector is, like, you've got, you've got a the water tank in the in the uh, you know uh, in the loft that is leaking and you've got this m massive leak coming down and then all the women are giving like one little j cloth to mop uh, it all up and then but no one's actually looking at the water tank and you know uh, actually doing anything to, to uh, stop it and i think that's that's where um uh i i like what i see is basically the sector I, it makes sense what she's saying about collaboration because i see the sector as is it is in a way a part of that whole kind of cycle because it's about supporting women on a very individual basis um kind of patching them up or supporting them to patch themselves up in some way and then what happens you know once they've once they've got out of that particular um if, if they get out of that particular relationship to then just go back into another one and the the whole thing the whole thing happens again and um and what i feel is that if 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 i if i was a woman in a situation in a, in a you know a relationship with with a violent man would i feel would would we feel more um optimistic if i were to leave that all together and go and live in feminist community with other with other women or if i had stayed with that man and then 
and just try to change him. And I think that's how I see it on a kind of micro level. And I think we'd all feel more optimistic about the, the first scenario than the, than the second one. And I think that's what she's saying when she talks about taking our eyes off the guys. It's about not endlessly putting, you know, putting our yes. energy and creativity into making things better with him or with another man. It's about that, what we were talking about, you know, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Separate. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that unfolds in the last chapter. That's why I wanted to read um, some from the last chapter to kind of get the flavor of that. But that's what it is. That's what she means by disengaging. I mean, you know, from, from the word go is disengaging. And I mean, there's something in the chat about, you know, getting women to notice men, male domination and male violence. Um, I think women do notice that, um, but can't name it. Um, and, you know, and, um, and have no idea how much men really hate us. And, um, and, and to, you know, for, for women to realize that is, is, I mean, is necessary because you can't, you kind of can't disengage from it unless you realize, you know, that you're sucked into it and, and how bad it is. Um, but what you're talking about is like turning your, is basically, you know, turning your back on men, leaving that relationship or just, you know, um, your, your husband, your son, your brother or whatever, um, is, is a monster and not all men are monsters, but it's just, you know what, turning your back on him. I think I think it's also I think it's also at what point does change happen because we can analyze and you know we can recount the horrors of male violence over and over and over and over again but at right. what point does change happen at what point does anything become different and what you know what um what uh, Sonia Johnson argues is that is that the means are the ends we have to start doing things differently now it's not because otherwise yeah. We're just always projecting into, you know, we always need more research. We always, oh, we need to understand this problem better. We need to, and, and actually in the, you know, in the long run, we're all dead. Like we can be doing that forever. We can be responding to that male violence and endlessly talking about it and researching it like forever. But at what, at what point do, does change happen? That's, uh, and I, yeah, I mean, you know, she, she, and she talked about like not trying to fix men um, and, you know, uh, because and that we can't change them that we, we can't there's, there's nothing we can do to change them um and that's why we have to disengage from dis disengage from them i mean why you know and she says um in, in you know i don't have a quote on it now but that why would they change really what's in it for them you know patriarchy is what it is what's in it for them why would they change they're not i mean they won't think, change but i think also um if we look at systems of power I think systems of power can change, but not through endlessly kind of, um, I, I think this is like one of her main arguments, through endlessly kind of appealing and lobbying and petitioning yeah. those who are in power. I think actually the shift in power dynamics that happens when like when women leave and separate, I think that is m more likely to create change. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah, I mean, and the, the participating, even if it's resistance and rebellion is, is part of what she calls collaboration. I mean, some people think it's, you know, they think of, you know, the French Vichy collaborators, but but what you're talking about in terms of the, the front on resistance is part of what she calls collaboration. And she says repeatedly through the book that oppressors can only continue to successfully oppress with the collaboration of the people who are oppressed. And that's not a new thing. I mean, Jean Sharp's book, Politics of Nonviolent Action, I mean, is a, a really good exposition of how and why um, that happens. Um, so, you know, somebody saying reject, not resist. Um, it's and it's not even so much rejection, although that's that's part of it. But it's basically turning turning your back on it. Disen she uses the word disengagement, which I think is the most apt word. Right. Well, I'm going to uh, because it, we've come to the end. So I'm yeah. going to um, do that. Uh, ending things. Th thank you so much uh, for the talk from Marion Rutigliana and Julia Long. Um, and also to everybody in the chat, everybody participating, we've had a really interesting debate in the chat <laughs> as well as listening to, um, to Marion and Julia. And I think what is great is that we're regularly meeting and we're unpicking some of the ideas and able to discuss different angles on them. And I'm always of the position, I tend to think that we, you know, uh, sometimes it looks as if we might be disagreeing, but then often as we carry on thinking about it, it turns out we've got a slightly different angle, um, but on many, many 
bits of it we do agree but we have maybe slightly different words and that's useful to sort of carry on thinking about the different words and what how to articulate what we really think so i'm i'm just really pleased that we're managing to meet together and uh discuss these books and we're going to carry on every week <laughs> that's the, that's the plan <laughs> so um next week we've got julie bindle coming on and talking about her new book feminism for women oh, surely. yeah and it's um so that will be really interesting and uh georgia asked in the chat something like is julie bindle's book the new uh taking our eyes off the guys or whatever this the the, the new sonia johnson book um yeah and i've actually got the julie bindle book so i'll just show that for next week so i've got that <laughs> there we are so we'll see what see what uh, she says and see what comes up in that book i've read a bit of it and we'll we'll hear about it next week and then carry on in the future okay thanks very much everybody and see you next week maybe or sometime okay thank you bye bye, -bye.